administration and health services management. I also call her my mother, uh, my academic mother, because my very first paper that I published was with her. Then, Priscilla, uh, Miss Priscilla Yewe Atifa is a lecturer in the School of Nursing and also a PhD student in the University of Maastricht in the Netherlands. And I am her local uh, supervisor. And so we came together to present this proposal and the University of Ghana found it worthy to award us the grant for the study. Mr. Chairman, let me read the first case. And this case, uh, is, I, I obtained permission from the Don Coco Presby Hospital, where I was the general manager between 20, uh, 2008 to 2010. And then, so after I, I joined academia and then was supposed to write cases as a business school, I requested for permission and they permitted me to use it and it has been published. So this one is published, uh, it's in the case center. On 5th May 2006, a 39 year old pregnant woman died while giving birth in the Hokun Presby Hospital in the Eastern region of Ghana. Two organizations accused the Kokun Presby Hospital of negligence of duty and petitioned the Ministry of Health to conduct investigation into the death of the woman. The Eastern Region Health Directorate was delegated to investigation. The Ministry of Health forwarded the investigative report to the Attorney General of Ghana for advice. Upon review, the agents of duty by the hospital. The AG therefore advised the family of the deceased that the, the, the advice that the family of the deceased should be compensated by the Presby Church of Ghana, which is the owner of the Donkokrum Presby Hospital. The district director of health services in Donkokrum intervened on behalf of the hospital, and the bereaved family reduced an otherwise big charge to a token amount of $1,000. $700. Uh, because I publish it, we publish it uh, in the case center, we, we give 2,500 Ghana cities. However, the hospital refused to pay the money, insisting that there was no negligence of duty. The hospital also questioned the basis upon which the AG was demanding the Presby Church of Ghana to pay compensation in view of the complementary role the church plays in providing health care to the people of Ghana. That is the case. What are the facts of the case? The disease reported in the hospital on 5th May 2006 at 10 a.m. for medical attention. She was examined by a senior midwife senior medical superintendent upon arrival at the hospital, and there was no adverse finding. She was examined again by the midwife on 9 duty at 8 p.m. The midwife did not recognize any risk. At 11.20 p.m., the night midwife called doctor because the patient's condition changed. However, the patient died a few minutes after the doctor arrived at the hospital at 11.42 p.m. So, <clears throat> in the opinion of the medical committee, there was negligence of duty on the part of the hospital. And uh, the medical committee was constituted by the senior management committee of the regional health directorate. So when they submitted their report, who said that the hospital acted negligently, the senior management committee reviewed that report, and they summarized it as follows, that there was only one midwife on duty for a 12-hourly work shift in a hospital with heavy duty shuttles. 
that the patient in question was duly seen by a doctor on call, but the call was too late as patient died a few minutes after the arrival of the doctor. That there was no barbaric behavior on the part of any staff of the hospital. That clinical autopsy ruled out ruptured uterus or any intra-abdominal hemorrhage. That the deceased died of obstructive complications of grand multipara in prolonged labor. And therefore, the senior management committee of the regional health directorate concluded that the patient was not entirely neglected. Now, the SMC recommendations to the Ministry of Health. Uh, the, the SMC blamed management. Okay, sorry. The SMC recommendations, Ministry of Health reversal, and then the PCG refusal. PCG is present check in Ghana. Now, the SMC blamed management of the hospital for allowing such a situation to persist for a long time, I recommended the following, that the hospital should institute a scholarship scheme for residents to train for various health professions, especially in the area of midwifery. And as a short-term measure, management should be placed with the regional health directory for nurses or midwives to be sent to the hospital for relieving duties, and that the regional health director should increase the number of permanent postings of midwives and medical assistants to the hospital. However, the Ministry of Health, upon the advice of the Attorney General Department, reversed the decision of the Senior Management Committee of the Regional Health Director and requested the Treasury Church to pay a compensation to the family for negligence. But the church declined payment. And there was a lot of back and forth. And that was the time I arrived. The case started in 2006. And then uh, all the correspondence went on. And when it was sent to the Attorney General Department, it took three years before they finally came out with their letter uh, asking that the church should uh, pay compensation to the family. And so the, the a district director of the Ngoko Plesby Hospital wanted to intervene because he had been there for so long and he was helping the hospital a lot, even though he was a Ghana Health Service staff. And uh, we thought that the compensation, but the people came and said we should pay something small. It was not within the ability of the hospital to pay. But in principle, the hospital said they cannot pay because they don't think that there was negligence. And also, to pay will amount to bribing to let the matter die, which is against the philosophy of the church. And so that is the dilemma. And so I conferred as the chief executive of the hospital, conferred with the board, and we decided to let the church lawyer handle it. And these are, among so many other legal arguments, these are some of the conclusions of the church lawyer. The attorney general's letter, Exhibit B, gives the clear impression of merely trying to insulate government, the government of Ghana from financial responsibility arises from what it considered a breach of duty or negligence of the Presby Hospital in the Okoku. That is the only explanation for the purely simplistic view it took of the case under consideration. The Attorney General, as the legal advisor of the government, is familiar with the myriad of challenges facing the country and has from time immemorial been encouraging others to come in to support, expand, and improve the medical landscape in the country. The government of Ghana is primarily responsible for the medical health of Ghanaians. The box stops directly at the door of the government. It cannot and will not be allowed to pass the buck to the present hospital at Dongokro. For its part, 
The Trevi Church should continue with its mission to provide, among others, medical support, not only at Donkoko, not even at Agogo, in the Ashanti region, nor in the northern regions, but also in all parts of the country. It is part of the church's mission to help the people, unquote. That is an aspect of the, the, how the lawyer concluded. After a long legal debate, citing authorities, blacks, law dictionaries, and all those things, very complicated, it ended on this note. And then the other issue is that the, the, the time had even elapsed because it had already uh, gone three years. And so the matter died. And the, 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 the church did not have to pay any compensation. That is the first case, which has implications for this lecture, which I will come to later as we continue. There is another case, and this is from literature, a, a classic example of adverse events, patient harm, and, and its effect which is often cited in the patient safety literature. A nurse who accidentally gave a sick baby a fatal dose of medicine committed suicide in the wake of the tragedy. The nurse was called Kimberly Heard, or Kim for sure, was said to be totally destroyed and devastated after she accidentally overdosed baby Kaya Zotna on September 14, 2010, with 10 times too much medication at Seattle's Children's Hospital. That mistake turned out to be the beginning of an unrivaled, unrivaled life, contributing not only to the death of the child, eight months old Kaya Zotna, but also to Heart's firing and her suicide on April 3 at the age 50, and that is the nurse who took her life because she was fired for giving overdose uh, of medication to a child at in, an intensive care unit in a children's hospital. The facts of the case, she gave 1.4 grams of calcium chloride instead of 140 milligrams. So that mistake is so 140 or 1.4. So one is in grams, the one is in milligrams. She, she was devastated, just devastated, was what uh, a colleague of her said of, of the whole incident. Without even the child had to die for the mistake. Now, she had worked for 24 years in the hospital, all of it in, in the hospital. And uh, there was no serious medical, medical mistake she ever made. And records show that she cared for Kaya Zotna many times since her birth. When the baby with severe heart problems was first brought to Seattle's Children's Hospital, she was close to the child's family who sought out her care, the record show. She was a Facebook friend with Alan, Alana Zotta, Zotna, that's it, uh, the child's mother, the ho hospital officials said. Now, there is this concept called the second victim concept. Now, here's dismissal and her death raise larger questions about the impact of errors on providers, the so-called victims of medical mistakes. Second victims is a phrase coined by Dr. Albert Wu, a professor of health policy and management at John Hopkins uh, School of Public Health. It's meant to describe the true casualties caused by a serious medical mistake. The first victim is the patient, the person hurt or killed by a preventable error. The second victim is the person who has to move with the aftermath of making the error. Doctors, nurses, and other medical workers who commit errors are often traumatized as well. 
with your actions that range from anxiety and sleeping problems to doubt about their professional abilities and thoughts of suicide. Research found that surgeons who believe they may be as likely to have considered suicide as those who didn't. Even when they don't think of killing themselves, medical workers who make errors are often shaken to their core. And that is the end of that case study. Just before we come, when we talk of the second victim phenomena, as it has already been explained, when an adverse event occurs, like the one we've cited, that the, 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 uh, that the men's did, the first victim is the patient, the child who died. The second victim is the nurse who is devastated as it was stated. Her anything yet. Now, I got this picture in 2013 when I was to make a, uh, a presentation to the Ghana College of uh, to the West African Ghana West African branch of the Ghana College of Nurses about Ghanaian nurses sleeping during night shifts in the UK. What happened to them? Night shifts, as reported by the Ghana News Agency, can be tedious, especially if you have to be awake all night. However, when you sign up to do a job and you are being paid to do so, you are legally obliged to work according to acceptable standards. Both were dismissed from their jobs that day and were later arrested by police. They faced charges of 19 counts of ill treatment or neglect of a person who lacks capacity, but they denied the charges. When I mentioned the fact that they were dismissed among the nurses, they laughed and laughed and laughed and laughed. Why do you think they were laughing? Because it's normal in Ghana. I have worked as a nurse myself, and I've slept before. <laughs> During night. <laughs> <laughs> but because uh, when we are talking about nurse patient ratio, we don't talk about that in Ghana here. Because you can be a nurse, the only nurse in the world of several patients. And you are walking from bed to bed, either giving drugs or certain up drips and so on during the night and then you go and sit at the nurse's table. You can do so. Okay, so they laugh because they know that it can't happen in Ghana. It can't happen out of necessity. Maybe even if it will happen, it will yet, it's yet to take a long time. And maybe it can only be in the urban areas, where sometimes you have more staff than needed compared with the rural areas. But let's look at a Ghanaian situation. This is a report, a quote, from one uh, anthropologist who came to st uh, study, do her PhD in Kolebu Teaching Hospital and, and stayed with nurses for several months while doing the research and observing the way they were working. Look at what she said. Uh, uh, this is a caption in her thesis our mother on the world, describing the matron, the one in charge of the world. In the morning, quote, she starts with taking up, making rounds with the night nurse. At each bed, she gives the patient in one of the local languages, followed by, how are you today? Have you had your bath already, and could you go to the toilet? Have you taken breakfast? She moves quickly to the notes of the evening and night shifts, and goes on to the next patient. When she realizes an incomplete mood or remark, she calls the nurse on duty in front of her, her colleagues uh, and the patients. Her 
Bring my nurse. Come. You always give it to the morning. What is your duty? You have to realize it on top and announce it to the day shift. Don't just wait till all is finished. Her tone is determined but friendly. And the nurses rush to correct their mistakes or omissions, apologizing and laughing. That's how she captured. So this is um, an in charge who the way she handles the nurses on the world and how they are not able to complete certain tasks, who can be potentially uh, dangerous, can lead to adverse events, and so on. And, and, and the way she corrects them, even in front of patients and uh, colleagues, in a loving manner, so that the work will go on. Now, we have been hearing about a lot of cases. And the uh, prof was talking about uh, uh, what he saw recently uh, about medical errors, okay? And I took these things from the website. Which hospital investigate allegations is medical officer left town in a human store? The Greater Accra Regional Hospital has once again come under the spotlight with allegations of medical negligence. In another case, the family of 24-year-old Barbara Ofurua Ajima in July 2020 accused the hospital of misdiagnosis after medical professionals allegedly treated their relative for COVID-19. They blamed medical staff for the death of their daughter, whose COVID-19 test results showed negative after she had died. In the latest allegation, a woman has given an account of how a medical doctor allegedly left a towel inside her stomach after a cesarean section had been performed on her. The woman narrated her ordeal to a crab-based angel FM, said the towel was dumped in her stomach for nine months. We are investigating the matter. It's an old thing, 2015, in the old age. Record systems have changed. The medical director at the hospital, Dr. Emmanuel Shofenyo, told the reporter, so they are investigating it, all right? But the point is that this is just to let us know what is happening. This is Rich Hospital, 37 military hospital. Medical negligence. My brother bloated to death, man's use 37 military hospital. Why? Oxygen tube was inserted wrongly. So instead of the oxygen going to the lungs, it was going somewhere, and the patient bloated. Court orders 37 military hospitals to pay over one million as damages for medical negligence. Why? Insisting the doctors insisted on normal delivery when the woman requested for cesarean section. And the time, by the time they did the cesarean section, the woman died. Then Kolebu Teaching Hospital. I was talking about 37 in Kolobu. Kolobu Teacher Hospital denies negligence in death of patient. Why? No bed syndrome. You will tell your patient there. They say no bed, and, and so on. And they pass to another place. They know the no bed syndrome. It's a big issue. And so the, uh, the hospital was accused of negligence. Patients use Kolobu for negligence. Why? A broken cannula similar to what <laughs> previous was saying, a broken cannula was left in one of her arms after she had been treated and discharged from the hospital. Teenagers were operating on the wrong leg. That is Kolebu. So you look at this, you look at 37, you look at Kolebu, and it telling us that it is an issue. Now let's come home, University of Ghana. And, and I'm very careful here. I am told the hospital was sent home not long ago. Why? Failure to allow a different surgeon to conduct another surgery after his first surgery reportedly resulted in the patient developing complications. And then poor documentation of the care and other procurement breaches. And the surgeon was said to be a very experienced surgeon. I'm told that sometimes 
uh, people who bypass other hospitals to come because they want him to operate on them. And he was also the director of the, the Universal Hospital. I have finished with the cases. The background to the topic. We are talking about patient safety. What is it? Patient safety, simply defined, is the reduction of the risk of unnecessary harm associated with healthcare to an acceptable minimum. Reducing the risk of unnecessary harm to an acceptable minimum. Meaning that some harms are unnecessary, it can be prevented. Now, what is harm? Harm is also known as adverse events or harmful incidents. They are used interchangeably depending on the literature you are reading. And it has been defined as unintended injuries caused by medical management rather than the disease process. So it is the, 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 the person didn't come, the patient didn't come with that problem. But in the course of managing the patient in the hospital, the medical management, nursing management, and so on, the person develops it. That is known as harm, patient harm. It can go from something small to something big and even can lead to death. It can lead to three outcomes. Prolonged stay in the hospital, prolonged disability, or death. That is the outcome of adverse events or harm. And I'll be using mostly adverse events from now on. And examples are also given here. Medication error, like the woman uh, Kim, Kim's case is an example of an adverse event. Pressure ulcers, when you come and then in the course when you stay in the hospital for long, and then you develop, you develop pressure ulcers or what they call bed sores. It's an example of an adverse event worth mentioning. Wrong side surgery, patient falls, new infection, infusion or transfusion reaction, physical restraint, where you can be tied to the bed, <laughs> just because you are restless. And then patients or their family complaints has now been also not uh, classified as an adverse event. When patients and their families are complaining so much. Now, errors are unavoidable in healthcare. In the developed countries, 10% of all hospitalized patients will experience an adverse event due to errors in healthcare. And we did a study here uh, in the University Hospital, and we, we, we found that 24% of all admitted cases, we reviewed medical records and saw that 24% of the sample we took had uh, adverse events. And safe care is one of the top 10 leading causes of death in the world. And it accounts for more lives lost than either lung cancer, diabetes, or injuries. And 134 million adverse events is due to unsafe care in hospitals, especially in low and middle income countries. And you know the cost of these things. If you lose a breadwinner, the social cost, and so on. So there's no question about the fact that uh, there is adverse events everywhere in the world, especially in developing countries. And the examples I have given has shown it. And it is because of this that the World Health Organization in 2019, set up World Patient Safety Day to be marked every 17th September every year. And for the past years, three years that Ghana marked it, I've been presenting uh, papers like this during the National Patient Safety Days uh, conferences held uh, by the Ministry of Health. Um, From patient safety, we are coming to safety culture. Because that's the study, what our study was about. Now, what is safety culture? 
technically it is defined as the enduring and shared beliefs and practices of organization members regarding the organization's willingness to detect and learn from errors. So we know that culture is the way of life of a people, or the way of life of an organization, or the way we do things here. So patient safety culture also means the way hospitals go about their care to ensure patient safety. That's the, the simple understanding of it. And it is tied to, it is called patient safety if it is, uh, it is called sa care is safe if it is able to detect, uh, the organization is willing to make sure that errors are detected and that lessons are learned so that errors can be prevented. Then we talk of uh, safety culture. And we are seeing that a culture of safety is spreading in high reliability organizations, which are characterized by complex risk processes but very low errors. Examples of high reliability organizations are the aviation industry and then the nuclear industry. They are that is, that is, that is how they are. And we will see the, the, the situation as far as the health sector is concerned. Our research gap was that we've done previous studies, and we've also other people have done their studies, and we found that uh, errors, which is the critical aspect of patient safety, the response to errors is mostly punitive. So you see that less than 50% of our previous studies uh, said that, you know, uh, rated, rated response to uh, errors positively. It was negative, it was below 50%. The benchmark is 70% or above. But you can see that it was about 50%. Another study that was done, rather even reported it low, 33%. Now, these studies did not look at, compare the safety culture and the adverse events to see whether the safety culture has an influence of adverse events. When we talk of the safety culture, it is the behavioral aspect that leads to uh, the, the, the safety of patients. So if the patient's safety good, then in terms of safety, then we need to we'll have a reflection on whether adverse events will occur or not. And so this study that we did was to make sure that we find out adverse events, whether adverse events are there on the other side, and whether one has an influence on the other. And when we are able to do that, then we'll be able to establish or conjecture whether there is a blame culture. If there are large reports of adverse events, the chances are that, and, and we record that the, uh, there is no punitive response, the no punitive response to error, error is low, the chances are that there is what? Blame, and people don't want to own up, and we shall see that. What is the origin of the blame culture? And this is a quote by John F. Kennedy, a former U.S. president. Let us not seek the Republican answer or the Democratic answer, but the right answer. Let us not seek to fix the blame for the past. Let us accept our own. Blaming in healthcare is common for resolving problems, referred to as the blame culture. Why do people blame? It is human nature and emotionally satisfying. And one writer said, the search for a scapegoat is the easiest of all hunting expeditions. It is human If you, 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 you punish a child, then you will not repeat it tomorrow. That is human belief. It is to the mistakes or misconduct of those in direct control of the treatment than to those at the managerial level. So, okay, uh, the advocate 
pointing and the blame is pointing at them. Nobody will look at whether there are management lapses that led to that. Healthcare providers accept responsibility for their actions as part of their training and code of practice. And I cited this from the Ministry of Health National Healthcare Quality Strategy 2017 to 2021. As one of their strategic interventions, look at this objective that, uh, you know, for the first quarter of 2020 2021, they will apply sanctions for non compliance with ethics or breaches of the patient charter or reporting false data in accordance with the code of ethics and code of discipline. Okay, and those who will be responsible for it are there. So it shows that is at the very core of our healthcare. According to James Reason, and he is uh, the father of safety science, human actions are almost always governed by factors beyond the control of the individual. To all is human. And we know facilitated erection by the Ministry of Health. And then I, I, I was getting lit and I rushed and I went to the workshop. I was going to the workshop and noticed that I wore one socks and then and, and, and I didn't wear another socks. <laughs> so I, I, fortunately, I was to pass through, by that time I was still on campus, I was to pass through the office before I go. So when I got to the office, I noticed I was wearing only one socks. So what I had to do was to remove it down. And then I wore the shoes without the socks. And it because it was this issue that I was facilitating the workshop. And so I, I told them that while I was coming, this is what happened to me. And I asked them, what are some of the silly mistakes that Come and see. And even some of my students that are always teaching. Somebody took the exam. And then he, he wore the glass like this and went to the exam and I was looking for his glass. <laughs> <laughs> so, it means, and James Wilson said that, error is the inevitable downside of having a brain. If you have a brain, that's what, in fact, that's what James Wilson is saying. It is the downside of having a brain. Once you have a brain, error is it's a must. So if you don't have a brain, fine, you make error. If, that's if you are a machine. Okay? People cannot easily avoid actions that they did not intend to perform. You can avoid. So if you intend to do something, if you don't intend to do anything bad, you can't avoid it. If you don't intend that I'm going to operate on this patient and put a tide in the, in the stomach, you can't stop it. People cannot easily avoid actions that they did not intend to perform. That's your vision. And healthcare professionals do not deliberately harm a patient. A deliberate action is called a violation. And according to one professor of Harvard School of Public Health, Dr. Lucian Lee, he said the single greatest impediment to error prevention in the medical industry is that we punish people for making mistakes. And the WHO, former WHO uh, president for World Alliance for Patient Safety also had this to say. He said, human error is inevitable. We can never eliminate it. We can eliminate problems in the system that make it more likely to happen. Shakespeare also said, alas, our frailty is the cause, not we. For such as we are made of, such we be. And Jesus Christ also said, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Jesus was looking at this, a systemic problem. And not a finger pointing plain culture. It is a problem in the system. The people who brought the woman forward also were part of that system and had that problem. Healthcare professionals are hesitant to report errors if they will be blamed. And 
have, as I teach my students, some of them are doctors, nurses, pharmacists. And when we come to this topic and I tell them that this is an academic environment, let's share. Open up. Let's hear your experience about uh, what is happening as far as uh, your errors are concerned. One of the students said, uh, a nurse, the exchange is now looking for normal saline. They thought it was normal saline. And, and, and what happened to the King case happened. They injected a, a child and the child died. And they kept quiet. They just kept quiet among themselves. And that was it. Maybe the confession was when I asked. Because of what? The fear of the finger pointing and the consequences. The healthcare organization will have great difficulty in learning from errors and thus decreasing the chance of future adverse incidents. A healthcare professional involved in an adverse event is a second victim, as I already mentioned. The first victim being the patient. And examples of second victim, you know, we have guilt, failing, distress, anxiety, fear, frustration, anger, and failing insufficient. And of course, is it, and emerging literature is also arguing that the organization is the third victim because the organization will never learn from the error. If the error occurs and they sweep it, it will keep recurring. The organization will continue to, to lose. Or if in the extreme case, the person commits suicide or the person is dismissed, the organization loses. Now I'm, I was saying that the surgeon who was dismissed uh, by the university, the community will come out and demonstrate. Because it's not easy to get a surgeon. And his son was at his retiring year. And that's how he retired. That is the psychological effect, the second victim that we are talking about. What is the theory surrounding the blame culture and why we should move away from it? We are moving away. The blame culture is a finger pointing culture. Asking the question who caused it rather than what caused it. Where we will look beyond the person to the system failures. And so the recommendation is to now adopt a systems approach. And healthcare is a system. And in fact, it is a, it is a complex system, like the nuclear and aviation industries. And in complex systems, there is always error. And somebody wrote, he said, it is embedded in the system like grains in the loaf of bread. It is impossible to create a completely error-free system. Error to a human act. A system approach examines the organizational factors that underpin dysfunctional healthcare and errors, rather than focus on people who are blamed for an error. And this type of approach helps move away from blaming towards understanding and improving the transparency of the processes of care. And so, James Wilson that I earlier spoke about, designed this. And it is used so much in the healthcare, um, in the aviation industry. So he says that there are a, a Swiss cheese, I mean, the, he showed me, we call it the Swiss cheese model, Swiss cheese framework. When I was teaching my student, I said, I've never seen a Swiss cheese before. They told me to go to Accra Mall. So, so they may tell that I don't know. <laughs> so the Swiss cheese has some those depressants serve as well. So, uh, reason, James Wilson is saying that if one slice has a weakness in it and the other slice doesn't have a weakness, it will prevent harm from passing through. But if the other slice also has a weakness in it, and all the slices of weakness and they align themselves, then harm will pass through. That is the Swiss cheese framework. And he categorized 
latent and active failures. Where latent failures are hidden, causing the problems at the front end. So the latent failures are at the blunt end, and then those businesses, nobody cares about it. And when they align themselves, they cause problems at the front end, or known as the sharp end. So latent failures examples are organizational influences, management policies, what management are supposed to do in terms of making sure that procurement practices are done well, so that no uh, two drugs that are similar should be procured together, and the nurses will confuse and then exchange one for the other. The drugs with similar names, similar levels, and so on. Now, supervision. If there's no proper supervision, you say people do what is inspected and not what is expected. It's a latent failure. Two conditions for unsafe care. One person taking care of so many patients. And we have, we see the Dombokun case. One means, one means life in a deprived place. The whole area, there's no government facility there. So it's only the Presbyterian Church that has, that took over from 1974. It was a health center, they converted it to a hospital. So when you are going to the affluent place, you must go by a pantoum. When you cross the first town you are, uh, you are getting to, there's a Presbyterian health center there. When you get the UDA health center there, and when you get to the Coco, they have a hospital there, no government facility. And uh, the church hospitals are paid by the government. It doesn't necessarily mean that they are given the same fairness like Ghana Health Service. So sometimes they struggle to get doctors, struggle to get nurses. And you could see from the case that when the incident happened, the people at the front end and not the back end. They looked at the active failures, the unsafe of the woman was that they brought the patient in the morning, two midwives examined no problem. Then suddenly they call a doctor, the doctor delayed some more. By the time the doctor came, patient was gone. They say negligence of duty. They just look at the active failure and forgot to look at the latent failures, which was actually described by the senior management. I'm a senior uh, management committee of the Real Health Directorate. Why should management allow such a thing to persist? That they don't have, they, they don't have midwives. So they said, that, look, they should make sure that they link up with the Real Health Directorate, even though it's a mission facility, they will post midwives there, and so on and so forth. They should send people for training, especially focusing on midwifery. They of the, the system without knowing. But that is where the first committee that was set up by them, they went and were looking at the active failures. Latent errors are those whose adverse consequences may lie dormant within the system for a long time, only becoming evident when they combine with other factors to build the system's defenses. So latent errors are most likely to be spawned by those who whose activities are removed from interface. Okay. Now, we are moving away from the blame and the just culture is saying that we are talking about the system, like Jim Wilson is saying. Look at the And we have a problem in Ghana, like the previous started by saying, where people are not satisfied the work of uh, health workers, that they don't care, they only they talk, and so on. And so if we are now calling that there should be no blame, what can happen? It then means that we are now calling for amnesty. That 
called the Asino de Sugunu Blame Kaja. That is not it. So the blame, there must be a balance between blame free, which is the same as amnesty. So if we are saying that there must be just culture, it doesn't mean that there must be, it must be blame free. We are running away from primitive culture because of the fear of what can happen, the adverse events, the, the fact that people will not own them and, and harm can happen. But it does not mean that it is a license to, uh, for people to sleep as the man who is lying on the coach. Okay, so then we are also talking of high reliability organizations, as I already mentioned. And the principles of high reliability organizations is that they are preoccupied with failure. They are always thinking that, look, the system that we have in place can fail. What can we do in place it fails? And they will take measures in place to make sure that nothing happens. So the aversion industry, you see that there are protocols, they don't talk about protocols, and so on. Uh, what we can see is usually when we enter into a plane and they keep repeating the announcements, even if you are moving from Accra to Kumasi, uh, they will announce as if you are going to... Uh, they sometimes we are fed up, but they don't want to take chances. They are preoccupied with failure. But that's even just... But there are more, there's more that is done at the background. Uh, there was one time that we heard that uh, uh, this aircraft... Uh, oh, what's your name? One of the aircraft that grounded, it was approaching and stopped. We just heard a part of one incident, and, and that was all. We haven't heard about them again. So don't joke about safety. Okay? They are sensitive to how each team member affects a process, and all those who are the it's only people who are knowledgeable should handle an issue. And they resist the temptation to blame individuals for errors. And they set up the world system to encourage error reporting. That is how far they have gone. So if you come to report, you will be rewarded. In fact, I read a book, one of the books, and they said that they organize a dinner for somebody who reported an error. That is, that is how far they can go. They want to encourage people to report errors rather than blame, and then they will sweep it under the carpet. So our objectives, as I already mentioned, was to see the levels of safety culture and the adverse events. We did a cross-sectional study in three regions. That is the Upper East region representing the Northern Zone, the Bono representing the Middle Zone, and then Greater Accra representing the Southern Zone. And our total sample size was 1,688, made up of uh, clinical staff like nurses, doctors, pharmacists, laboratory, and radiology staff and unit managers. All right, and we use a questionnaire that is generally used for assessing patient safety, and it is here. There are two of them. So communication about error is talking about making sure that staff are informed when errors occur, and ways are discussed to prevent errors, and when changes take place, they inform them again. That's communication about error. It will ensure patient safety. Another one is communication openness. Where staff pick up, speak up, if they see something unsafe and feel com comfortable asking questions. Then handing over, where important patient care information is transferred from one shift to the other, so that you, uh, uh, the nurses or the doctors cannot leave, and then those who are taking over don't know what to do. And then that can lead to an adverse event. It's a safety measure. Then, of course, hospital management support, as we are talking about the latent failures, organizational influences. Then, organizational learning, whether work processes are regularly reviewed and changes are made to keep mistakes from happening again. All these things, and if I Learning. If these things are in a, in a hospital, it means that there is what? Safety, the measures are put in place to ensure patient safety. These are safety culture measures. And then, of course, 
reporting patient safety events, the critical ones. Mistakes of the following types are reported. Mistakes that are caught and corrected before reaching the patient, and then mistakes that could have harmed the patient but did not, which we call near misses. Then response to error. That means staff are treated fairly when they make mistakes, and there is a focus on learning from mistakes and supporting staff involved in errors, and not to blame. Then, of course, workload, staff and workplace. There are enough staff to handle the workload, staff work appropriate hours, and do not feel rushed, and there is appropriate reliance on temporary, float, or local staff. Then supervision. Supervisors, managers, or clinical leaders consider staff suggestions for improving patient safety, and they do not encourage shortcuts and take action to address patient safety concerns. And team effective team help each other during busy times and are respectful to one another. So these are the 10 dimensions of the other, uh, other organizations or uh, other safety models use this approach where they measure the maturity levels of hospitals as far as safety is concerned. And they say uh, when safety of a particular hospital is pathological or an organization is pathological, it means that investment into improvement is pathological. Reactive means safety occurs in response to an incident. Only when something happened before, it's reactive. Bureaucratic, safety is on workers, on the workforce. Proactive, there is value placed in safety with continually improving systems. And generative, the ultimate, yeah, that is the idea. Where safety is an integral part of everyday life, in all staff. And this is the level that high reliability organizations like the aviation industry, the nuclear industry, are said to be operating on generative level. So, and these are the adverse events I've already mentioned them, medication errors, pressure ulcers, and the rest. Our results. So we have the social demographic indicators here, uh, where we look at the, the region. The samples were fairly distributed. With greater Accra being higher because we had a teaching hospital to act. That's why there are 52. Teaching hospital was considered one region. Then the sex is there. The age categorization of the respondents were there. And uh, marital status, those who were married were known, about 65%. Those, most of them were educated up to tertiary level. And then, uh, the primary work area, 41% were in the medical surgical units. We also had emergency care units, labor uh, delivery units, pediatric units, uh, and specialist services, diagnostic and other clinical services, then administration support services. And of course, the nursing staff were the majority, 72%. Now, we have mentioned um, in a likely scale, ranging from strongly disagreeing to strongly disagree, 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 neutral, agree, and then what? Strongly agree. So we took a positive response. If you agree or strongly agree, it's a positive response. And the literature says that if you want to assert the safety culture, the positive And so you see that among the 10 dimensions here are the group and you've seen that the 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 positive percentage of positive response has passed the the standard. It has exceeded the standard. So we have teamwork, organizational learning. Uh, you know, supervisory support, communication about error, and then handovers. The, uh, the standard, which is good, that is the idea. But staffing was rated. But it's just that they want to, you know. So
then uh, you see that the critical ones were left out. Response to error, as we were saying. How do managing members respond to error? Okay, is it punitive or non punitive? See, that one was almost 60%. And then what? Uh, yes, so reporting. And those are the critical things if you want to see whether there's a blame culture. They may you are reporting the events and you are not reporting. Why are you not reporting? That one is below the, the standard. Then we, we look at the, the maturity levels. And as I told you, it was uh, bureaucratic, uh, proactive, and then generative. So we took If it is pathological law, if it is uh, active law, if it is uh, bureaucratic law, bureaucratic means you put the, 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 all the systems are put in place with action uh, plans, everything. You know, when they come for supervision from the Ghana service and other things, oh, oh, you have a, 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 a listen, uh, an action plan to address safety issues, and okay, we'll take it, but it's not implemented. That's bureaucratic uh, safety uh, structure. But the ones are the proactive ones, and then the generative ones. Now, we add the two together, it was 59, not up to 70, the green, the green one, which is the standard. That tells you that 70, even though they themselves admitted that, they are not operating at the what? At the proactive or uh, generative level before the new standard. Then we come to adverse events. That is a critical thing. Where we assess medication errors. Look at the rate. So less than 30% responded that there is no medication error. That is what we are looking for. We wanted that at least 70% will report that no medication error. But we knew that there is a problem of medication error. Because either they said, 41% said, Medication errors, errors occur once a month. Then about 30% said other. I mean, some, some say several others times a day, once a day, or several times a year. That's why all that is put under other. Then pressure ulcers. See, 48% said none. Okay, the rest is either occurring once a month and so on. False, patient false. All these less than the standard, the green one. Physical restraint. That is the only place that exceeded the target. Where well, we are, as we don't expect that, because you say you are busy, you uh, tie a patient to bed and then restrict the patient. So that one day, so we don't do those things. New infection is a problem. So new infection is a symptom of poor care, okay? Because you are supposed to sterilize the things very well and, and kill all the organisms before you dress and use what we call aseptic techniques and so on. So if there is no infection, whether it is surgical wound or not, then it's a problem. Look at the rating. You can see very low. It means there's a lot of infection transfusion reactions. These are all adverse events. Okay, and this is where the problem was more. The other is the highest because we added the rest once a month was more, and the rest uh, several times a day, uh, several times a week, and so on were less. But in this case, several times a week was the highest. Unfortunately, we had to add it as other. And look at the rate. So there's a lot of family complaints as far as patient safety issues are concerned. So we wanted to look at the relationships. So we weren't just looking at them separately. Are they related? And we use what we call bivariate correlation. And 
when we do the correlation, those that are there, they were the only ones that were not uh, correlated, I mean, they were not significant. It means that medication error, if you look at team work, there's a correlation between team work and medication error, and pressure ulcers, and patient falls, physical routine, all of it is correlated. All of them are correlated. And the correlation uh, coefficient is negative. To mean that when one is increasing, one is decreasing. So, and medication error. The correlation coefficient is 0.161. Okay, so it then means that when you, what? Uh, Team errors will what? Will increase. That's what it means. When organizational learning is reduced, medication errors will increase. When response to error is reducing, medication errors will increase. So the important thing about the correlation is that we are looking at whether it's correlated and it's significant by the stars, so it means it's significant. There's a significant correlation. But what's the direction of the correlation? Is it inverse or direct? So inverse relationship means if one is increasing, one is reducing, and that's the most important thing. And this is enough for us to know that there is a correlation between adverse events and what? Patient safety culture. So if there is a higher patient safety culture, adverse events will reduce. If there is a lower safety culture, adverse events will increase. That is the conclusion of this table. The same action and the rest. So we are talking about moving away from the blame culture to a just culture. And there's one authority who said, David Marx, who said that, look, we have to, if we want to categorize behavior, to know whether to punish or not to punish. The way he is proposing. If it is a human error, we know that an error is a product of our current system design and our behavioral choices. Okay? It is the latent factors that is always producing human error, according to him. That is what he describes as system design. All right? And according to him, if it is so, um, it is a, a human error which is based on system design. Okay, we should focus on the choices that we will make, the processes we should use, the procedures, training, the way we design the system, and we look at the environmental context and, in fact, console rather than punish. So, uh, the, the case that we use, the, the, the nurse who made the, or the, 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 or the hospital case here, okay, those are the concluded cases that we know. So you, you realize that you want to find out whether it was an error, a human error or not. And once you know that it is a human error, and we have already established that human errors are unintentional. You cannot prevent what you didn't intend to do. So once it is unintentional, then what the person needs is consolation rather than punishment. What about, we also categorize another behavior as at-risk behavior. That is a choice. A risk behavior. So there are what we call intentional violations and unintentional violations. Intentional violations, we've all done it. In the world, they will tell you that nurses, you are supposed to take vital signs either every four hours or six hours. It is not done. That, that is the, 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 that's what you are supposed to do. And it is a violation that's intentional. Okay? It is an at risk behavior. But it is understandable because you have to look at the context, look at the pressure of work, and so on, and see whether. Does it amount to anything? So, how do you manage it? 
we have to remove the incentive for the adverse behavior. Whatever is uh, letting them do that, we try to remove it. And create uh, increased situational awareness. But what about the reckless behavior? He said, and, and, and for that, for the adverse behavior, he recommended conscious disregard of substantial and unjustifiable risk. And it might be managed either through remedial action or punitive action. That is to punish. And this is how he thinks that it will be that balancing between punitive action and blame free. So he says it should not be played, categorize it into whether it is a human or, or is it an adverse behavior or it is a reckless behavior. And either console, coach, or punish. Okay? And he has explained them further here. Let's just look at this small video. The 80 20 rule. This idea was first introduced in 1906 by Italian economist Vilfredo Pareto, which is a very cool. The sun is not coming. And he noted that 80% of the wealth the in Italy 80, in the early 20th rule. century. This idea was first introduced in 1906 by Italian economist Vilfredo Pareto, which is a very cool name. And he noted that 80% of the wealth in Italy in the early 20th century. Produced about 80% of the peas. While not an exact science, it's common that a small percentage of people accomplish the largest percentage of outcome at churches or maybe where you work. Or maybe you've noticed that sometimes a small percentage of people can cause the largest percentage of problems at church or where you work. This principle is helpful in other ways as well. For example, when you think about it, we rarely get 100% of what we want in life. For example, you go on your dream vacation, but your flight is delayed and it rains for two days. Or you finally get the job you wanted, but your boss is tough to work for and the hours are long. Or one day you move into your dream house, only A principle that is applied for all the to blessings that God look. look at the bigger picture. Um, he was the concluding part. He said uh, the principle can even apply in families, it's where uh, spouses make all the effort. They do well at least eighty percent, but the twenty percent that is not done well. The focus Can we look at that? That's the just culture. That what are we doing right? And there is an emerging patient safety theory which is moving away from, we've divided safety into safety one and safety two. So to find adverse events, even this research is based on safety one, trying to find uh, problems and fix them. The emerging safety theory safety two is saying find the, uh, the problems. Try and look at what is making the 80% achievements. How are people able to achieve 80% results in the midst of resource constraints and so on? So that 
instead of condemning yourself for the 20% that you have not been able to achieve, the 20% false that you are blaming and, and, and dismissing and, and so on, look at the bigger picture. Look at how far you know, the people have come. The woman who was sacked, 24 years of what? Uh, care in the hospital. That it was the only medical, serious medical mistake that she made. And all the experience. This is a woman who even had personal relationship with the, the child's mother, had a Facebook friend, and so on. She was dismissed. But we didn't look at the 80%. The success story of the woman, they looked at only the end. And so that, that is a brain culture. And so our conclusions, our research, have found that patient safety culture is generally good. However, the pattern of adverse events is low. And these are in line with literature. And there is a correlation. The findings point to the presence of a blame culture in the new hospitals, in spite of the high patient safety ratings that we have seen. It is imperative to move from the blame to the just culture towards improvement of patient safety in the young hospitals. And the recommendations are that we need, among other things, to develop relationship with patients. And when we were hearing the stories of the 37 military, we were told how the patients were trying to get in touch with the medical team, it was a problem. We need to develop relationship with our patients, communication. And when something happens, we should open up. And there should be a mechanism by which we should be very honest about what has happened. And I am sure that the litigation then we should avoid, we should understand that multiple factors are involved in failures, latent and active failures. We should avoid blaming when errors occurs. We should practice evidence-based care. Maintain continuity of care for patients. Even some facilities call to find out how their patients are, uh, are faring, you know, and build that kind of customer loyalty and rapport. And then we should be aware of the importance of self-care because that's one of the problems, you know. We should psychosocial care, uh, that's, occupational, that's on the part of occupational health and safety. Psychosocial, uh, personal health resources, exercises, and so on for staff. It will all go a long way to uh, encourage them to make sure that they do their best to uh, maintain patient safety, act ethically every day, look at the bigger picture like the Pareto principle. And this psychologist, Carl Rogers, talked about the unconditional positive regard. Look at the person which is strength and weaknesses. And not just when things are positive about the person before you will look at it. And finally, console, coach, or punish. Where necessary. Well, Barakallah Salah to our Muslim brothers and uh, uh, except that thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, not fasting. Are you, are you Muslim, right? I'm a Muslim. So, yes. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much. So, yes. Uh, are you you're Muslim, right? I'm a Muslim. So, you're supposed to start fasting today. Yeah, well. And so I want to acknowledge uh, my family, my wife is here, and uh, my siblings, my friends. Uh, Solomon Atega. These are people who have impacted my life so well. And uh, I have some beginnings. Time is no longer there for me to explain. And there are people who have, who are associated with my beginnings. I didn't go to school early. I, I went to school around, when I was around 13 years or even more. And through the Ghana Institute of Linguistics, I, I was doing, I read in my marathon. And uh, one Reverend Van Vell Huizen, who is now a retired minister of the gospel in the Netherlands, saw the potential of me and told me to go to school. And so I owe a debt of gratitude to him. 
and Reverend uh, U.O. Anamba, who was the one who succeeded him, uh, and he took over, gave me money that uh, the pastor gave for me to go to school. And then Reverend Dr. J.O. Mbila, and I'm very honored that he's here in our presence here. In my secondary school days, he already, I'm sure maybe God was speaking to him, he identified my potential and was so concerned about my progress that I was going, I was fearing of along the line, taking up certain characters and he observed. And for me, an unknown, somebody that nobody knows me, he had all the time to look for me, to try and speak to me and advise me. And since then, it altered my life. That everywhere I go, it is as if he's watching. And I, Papa, I'm very grateful to you. Yes. That life, the Presbyterian Health Services, I went, started nursing school with the Presbyterian Health Services, finished and worked as a nurse, went and came and did nursing here, went back and was a nursing tutor. All these things, they were sponsoring me. They sponsored me to come back here and do my MBA. I went back and worked as a hospital administrator. They made me a general manager. And then after I finished serving my bond, then I now came to join the university. I, um, I owe a debt of gratitude to the Presby uh, Church and the Presby Health Services. University of Ghana, when I came here, the university, I, 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 I can say that I was very lucky. Uh, the university has handled me very well. I worked for some time. They sponsored me free. I was collecting my salary and doing my PhD. And they facilitated uh, money for me to uh, do my research to finish my PhD. And I finished. It's a, a place of opportunity. I am very grateful to the university. The business school is another good place. And I said, I couldn't have been any other place apart from the business school. So some researches here and there. And so it helped me. I worked hard, and God helped me. And then, you know, through the business school support, I have come this far. The College of Humanities that has organized this forum for me to, to present it, the case. I'm indebted to the college for everything that they have done. I'm so surprised. They even did brushes. I thought it was a light matter. So, <laughs> so when I saw it, I said, hey, then I have to sit up. <laughs> I have my academic mentors. Professor Joshua Abbott, he was the one who convinced me to join academia. And then I came. And he like, he prepared for me, he held my hand like this, and showed me the academic road. When I came, I was a like a fish out of water. You know, you know the academic how to publish, and so on. And then, of course, uh, I would just join Professor Abba with uh, Dr. Patience Abba, who I already mentioned earlier, that I published with her. They helped me a lot, and I will not forget. Professor Amaya Dunfe, uh, also is my father, and my academic mentor here, and Professor Edward Nketiah Ponsa, with whom I did this research. The three of them supervised my PhD. And I've always told people that I wish everybody would have the kind of, that kind of, super, those kind of, that kind of supervision. You know, I, I learned a lot under them, and I, I continue to research with some of them, like of, uh, uh, Ketian Ponsa, consult with him, and so on. But uh, Abu Poku, who has retired, was uh, the head of the department uh, when I was here doing my MBA, and I came and met him before he left. He took me like a son. In fact, it wasn't easy for me to do MPhil, and he fought hard to make sure that I did the MPhil, and I, I, I am indebted to him. Dr. James Kazili is Navarro Health Research Center, one of my mentors, of course, Professor Justice Powley. Uh, he is, <laughs> and he knows me so well, the former, uh, the current dean of the business school. He knows me so well that he described me and my wife asked me, I haven't told you, but how does your boss know you so well like that? You know, so uh, he encouraged me, he's a great inspiration to me, my research, and so my PhD, he gave me perfect PhD. He collected it and then they matter for me. 
I'm very grateful, Papa. And then, Roger, when I came, he was always with me. We passed Professor John Efa. There are many. I cannot. I have my spiritual parents and mentors also. Reverend Yabuama, Reverend Mrs. Agnes Phillips, Reverend Julius Kusi, uh, the late Professor J. M. Dodo, Dr. V.C.K. Kani Kakani, and then Mr. Adam Senamu, all in LRC. They are my spiritual. God bless you so much for your work and passion. Thank our distinguished lecturer for a very inspiring lecture. As part of the intercollege lecture series, we have opportunity to ask questions and to make comments. I will kindly ask that you raise your hand. I hope there's a mic close by. If not, this one will go around. So that if you have a question or a comment, the lecturer can then take them. When you get up, you please give us your name. It need not be a question, it could be a comment. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Abuisi. Um, um, for the very excellent and inspiring lecture. Um, I guess that the core of the lecture touches every one of us, anybody who's been sick and gone to the hospital or has had to receive health care. I see your um, presentation, and I left momentarily, so maybe you have touched on that. Your lecture sought to focus more on the, the, the caregiver, uh, looking at whether to punish or not to punish, uh, to encourage, to coach, to mentor. Um, I didn't hear much about the victim. For example, um, you put yourself in a situation where a mother who has a, an only child loses the child because of negligence, um, whether um, intentional or unintentional negligence. And in the case of the hospital, the Donkok room story that you narrated, I see that it was largely on the part of wanting to establish blame for the hospital. And in that story, there was not a lot told us about so what happened to the family of this person uh, who died, uh, what support systems existed for such victims, and many, many other things. And if you look at it within the broader sociocultural context of Someone like me, the only person who went to school in my father's big house, my father had five wives. Of his many children, I was the only one that went to school. Um, of my immediate and extended family, I am still a first generation scholar. So if by virtue of an accident, negligence, um, I have to die, and the emphasis is on the fact that uh, uh, how do we treat the and, and and my family is not being you know factored into the picture how does um, a supportive system balance this from a hospital and the staff who are going the extra mile breaking their neck to try and do good but in the process take away somebody or some relative or some, the way the Ashantis will say it, somebody's dish here, you know, uh, 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 um, a big person or a, a somebody that perhaps the entire family is like a breadwinner of a family. How, how do you balance that in the, in the theories and the, um, the cases that you have analyzed? Thank you. Yeah. Oh, please, yes, please. Okay. If there are any others, then we'll take it all together. Yes, please. Your name, please, then we ask you. 
Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you. My name is Jesse Morrison. Um, yes, please. Um, my question is, I believe there are regulatory bodies that look um, into these um, activities that occurs at the um, hospitals. So I would want to ask, is it that the regulatory bodies are not performing their duties so well um, when it comes to monitoring um, such activities? Or if they are doing what you think um, they should improve on, that would help um, shift this blame game to rather a just culture? Thank you. Okay. Since we'll have more interaction after this, if there's any other pressing question, the very last, somebody, if you have a very, very pressing question, please ask it. Other than that, to ask our lecturer to give us a response, and then, yes? Okay. Uh, no, I, I don't know. Thank you so much. Yeah. So, um, well, good, he's out there. Okay, so I think uh, if I understood him, he was talking about uh, what happens to the, the bereaved family uh, when they've lost a loved one, like the Don Kokron case, where they had to report to the Ministry of Health, and then the Ministry of Health requested for investigation. Yeah, so um, there is something we call uh, patients and family engagement. It's a whole area that we cannot. So it is an area where uh, they want to make sure that there are mechanisms by which we will deal with parents, uh, patients, their, 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 their caregivers, their family, and the, and the system in a way that, you know, from the beginning of the care process to the end, if something happens, you know, uh, everybody check it. Uh, the current system where, you know, when you send patients, like you, you have brought your patient, you don't know, you are nursing around to find out what is actually happening. You heard the story in the 37 military case. You are, so there's, that's why I mentioned about communication. You know, so there's the need for proper communication at every step of the way. If it is about surgery, the implications of the surgery must be properly explained, and then the patients know. I mean, if it is a risky case, they must be, the, 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 the family must know the, the, the possible outcomes of the, of, the, of the case, and so on. So at every stage of the process, if there's a proper engagement of parents, patients and their family, you know, and then an adverse event comes, the access could be different. But beyond that, even if you can, there can be no uh, compensation here and there, even where there is compensation, uh, uh, must, like the, the, the Cochrane case, yes, then once it is justified the, and, and we categorize the, the situation as this, we consider it as a human error. And yet, the support, uh, yes, the second victim, and not to point accusing fingers or to crucify him for it. So it is about me identifying where the problem is and how best to, to tackle it. And if the patients are involved, the relatives are involved, they may not take the matter so hard to understand that they are involved from the onset and they know their progress, okay? If they are not well involved, uh, I mean, if, uh, uh, even, even if they are then the hospital should not abandon uh, the, the, the person. Okay. And then we are talking about regulatory bodies. Yes, regulatory bodies are there. And, and they do their work. Uh, in Ghana, we have the Health Facilities Regulatory Agency. And uh, they make sure that the standards of hospitals are met and the hospitals are categorized according to levels, uh, whether primary, primary level, secondary level, tertiary level, and, and, and there are certain benchmarks that you must meet. But that doesn't prevent uh, patient harm. As we, we said, even in the advanced countries with all the state-of-the-art uh, equipment and so on, you see 10% of all admitted cases will still get an adverse event. 
So we must, uh, while we want to make sure that our regulatory bodies work well, we still have to put some of these measures in place so that we can promote uh, patient safety. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Wilson, for giving us those insightful understandings. Thank you so much also for coming. So ask our provost to please give us his closing remarks, and then we'll bring the evening to an end. Thank you, College Secretary. I think that um, we would all agree that uh, Professor Abuasi has done absolute justice to the topic. Not only has he explained why nurses behave the way they do, <laughs> but he has also told us what we especially in terms of the structures and systems that we have for the healthcare personnel to work with and in. But I think that uh, recommendations that is prophet is put forward, some of the things that is introduced, we can clearly see cut across the whole, shall we say, the length and breadth of our uh, socioeconomic system. So he mentioned that in certain organizations, they have a certain attitude to safety and they think about what could possibly go wrong. And he mentioned the aviation sector and then the nuclear energy sector. I consider that it's something that of our lives. We have a very funny situation here um, so, so he blames the college. You know, I haven't heard from them. I don't know. So he's looking at the active area. That is, 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 is me. He sees me in the car park. A provost asks for you, what happened to my application? And I say, oh. But you see, you didn't even sign it. We sent it to you. Ah, I have to sign it, eh? <laughs> Conversation by saying that he's applied and he hasn't heard anything from us. But he doesn't want to sign the application. So what I'm saying is that clearly the lessons drawn from this lecture are things that we can apply wherever it is that we are operating at. That the systems and the structures and the people, no, the systems and the structures must be put, made, put in a way that allow the people to give up their best. Because if you only look at the people, then we are forgetting about the situation in which the systems are working. So, Prof. Bruce, thank you very much for opening my eyes to these very important issues. And uh, hopefully, next time that we we hear from you, you'll be telling us that these days hospitals in Ghana do not operate on your left leg instead of your right leg. I mean, clearly, there's a difference between left and right. So if <laughs> anyway, that's what I like to So thank you all for, oh, I think the colleague secretary will do that. But let me thank you for coming. Um, thank you everyone for the fantastic uh, lecture. Let me thank your family members, your friends, uh, admirers, uh, nurses who have committed mistakes with you and slept on the work with you. <laughs> and then we to, to make this um, a fantastic lecture. Thank you very much. We will also thank the provost for chairing it so well. We also want to thank all of you for being such a good audience, for participating so well. We know that going forward, there'll be so many issues that will come out of it, and you'll engage the distinguished lecturer on it. The intercollege lecture series actually is on the, under the auspices of the 
Public Affairs Directorate. So the director and her team put in so much to make sure that we are able to have these lectures. So we thank them. The media and audiovisual teams are also here, and they are the ones who make sure that everything gets where we get the larger visibility and publicity. So we thank you all so, so very much. At the college, the lecture series is ably handled by our assistant registrar in charge of general administration and public relations and her team. And we also thank them for all they put in to get it. You saw Prof. Agosi was very excited about our little <laughs> brochure. Yes. Keep it, save it, and let's make sure that we participate in these things all very much. For you, our wonderful audience, we are grateful. And we ask that you have a pleasant evening. And then there is some small refreshment. The order of our refreshment is that students will have their packs, and the invited guests and faculty will engage the distinguished lecturer at the basement. We thank you so, so much for coming. Do have a very pleasant evening. I beg you, you have